What is your full name? Joseph Virgil Lynn Jr. And when and where were you born? I was born in Stonington, Illinois, out in the country. The doctor came to the place April 21st, 1924. And in the 376 bomb group, which squadron were you in? 514th. Going back to the years before World War II started, what was life like for you uh, during the Great Depression? Well, we lived on a farm, and so we had our own milk and eggs and and uh, our own garden and so forth, so food wasn't any problem. We uh, had two pairs of overalls, one to go to school and one to do the chores in, one pair of shoes that you wore to school and church and then, or no, uh, to church, and when you went to school, you took them off. I was barefooted in school till winter. And it, uh, everybody was poor, but nobody is all the same. Everybody was in the same boat, and you didn't really realize you were poor. So it was a, it was kind of a rough time. Do you think that those hardships and, you know, the life that you lived helped strengthen you and prepare you for being in the military? Oh, I'm sure that it did. Uh, yeah, because you, you had to make do with what you did, and and uh, what you had and the uh, same is kind of true once we got over there why you kind of made do with what you could get a hold of so i'm sure it helped sure sure um where were you and do you recall what you were doing or what your reaction was when pearl harbor was attacked yes i was a student at the university of illinois and uh I was, it was about four o'clock when it came over the radio, and of course it spread like wildfire. Everybody then rushed to the radio to to get the news. So, uh, but I remember uh, my dad was combining beans because it had been wet that fall, and uh, he was in the field combining. So I knew it before he did, but I, I was a student at U of I. And um, what level of education did you reach before you entered the military? I was in my sophomore year at the U of I when I enlisted. And uh, I enlisted the 11th day of December of, of 40, oh, I don't know, 43 or 4, 43, I guess. And then the, they didn't call me then until, I don't know, five or six months later. Right. Did you um, did you en- did you enlist or did you choose to enlist? To- oh, I enlisted. Uh, yeah, I had to get permission from my folks. They said, "Oh, you can come home and farm." And I said, "I don't want any part of that." <laughs> and uh, there was uh, eight of us from the fraternity went out to Rantoul and enlisted at the same time. And of the eight, four of them wound up in fighters, and four of them in in bombers. And uh, everyone that enlisted in and got in the fighters died. So the, the bomber boys were the only ones that came back. Wow. And which fraternity was that? Alpha Gamma Rho. All right. Which mm. was an agriculture fraternity. Very good. Very good. Um, did you, um, was there a chance that you might have been drafted? Uh, basically, why did you try to enlist in the Army Air Force? Or was that your first choice? Oh, you know, that's where all my buddies, when we... All the fraternity brothers were going to the Air Force, and and uh, besides that, uh, we thought maybe that uh, there's a little more glamour to the Air Force was in the infantry. But uh, I could have probably came home and and got a deferment. Uh, I had uh, I had registered and was a C1, which was a long ways down. So uh, I'm sure that I wouldn't have been drafted if I hadn't enlisted. I would have. I would have come home and helped Dad on the farm. Sure, sure. The um, because I've I've talked with a number of veterans who actually enlisted either in the Army, Air Force, or the Marines, or whatever in a, in in order not to be drafted and have kind of a choice of where they went and what they might do. Yeah, no, I'm I'm sure I wouldn't have been drafted. I could have I could have stayed come home. Very good. 
where was your um, basic training, uh, and what was that experience like? <laughs> it was at uh, Shepherd Field, Texas, and uh, all the wind blew and the dust blew, and it, uh, I, I think it probably was the worst place in the world to do your basic. Anyhow, uh, about halfway through the basic, somebody got spinal meningitis, and then they quarantined us all, and we had to go back then and start over basic the second time. And I remember uh, one thing, they had to crawl through a culvert. And at the, about the time he was halfway through the culvert, there was a PFC at the other end and threw a shovel full of dust in that culvert. And I thought, oh, if I ever get out of here, and I'll look that guy up, and I'll throw more than dust at him. But uh, I soon forgot it. But, oh, what a... That was, the, of all the things that happened to me at basic training, that was the thing that stuck with me more than anything else. Right, right. Um, and had you been, had you traveled a lot before you joined the uh, the military? No, I had, I was a farm boy, and all I traveled was doing the chores and went to the UI, and that was, I probably hadn't even been out of the state. Okay, okay. When you went on to your more advanced training, uh, where did you do that training, and uh, what was what was that experience like? Well, I thought to my soul I'd never get out of Texas. I probably was at uh, 15 different airfields in Texas, and uh, sometimes I'd stay there three or four days and sometimes a week or sometimes two or three months. And then after I got out of Texas, by then we had that CDD or something like that training that uh, – Shreveport, Louisiana, at Centenary College, and uh, that was a kind of a civilian deal there. And, and uh, well, I wound up uh, the uh, CO of that college training detachment, and so I had the run of the place. I could no hours. I could leave any night and come back any time, but I had no place to go, so I didn't. But I. I wound up uh, CO quite by accident. What um, what were um, what were some of your training exercises like in at, at these various uh, uh, installations? Well, the 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 physical end of it seemed to be the thing that stuck with me more than anything else. Uh, we ran uh, seven miles and signed our name on a pad on a stump in the timber and then ran seven miles back and then we'd run up and down the stadium steps uh, seven times and uh, oh, I wound up with a charley horse about the size of a grapefruit and wound up in the hospital but uh, they got that worked back down but that uh, the physical end of it was the part I remember the most uh, they kept stressing that uh, you would be looking around all the time, and they wanted your neck to have all kinds of neck muscles. And once I got in combat, I don't think I looked around once. But anyhow, that was the, what they kept stressing was you got to have strong neck muscles. In terms of some of your uh, technical training, I, I understand you uh, ended up as a bombardier. How did that come about, and what was your training like I, for that? When it took the test, if you made over 120, you had your choice. And I made 123 on that test. And I, I put down Bombardier as first choice. And the, the reason that I did that, the pilot, he worked all the time to get you there. The navigator, he wanted to make sure you got there and all the gunners were protecting you. And after all, everybody worked for for the bombardier, and you had about uh, 20 minutes of glory, because everything it was all depended on you, and I, um, that's what I wanted. I, I, my, that was my first choice, and uh, that's what I wound up. And you know, some of them uh, wound up or took pilots and morphed out, then took bombardier, but I, I didn't. That was my first choice, and that's the one I got. Good, good. The um. When you were going through your training, especially when you started to fly and do your exercises with the bomb site and that sort of thing, can you tell me a little bit about what that experience was like? Yeah, that uh, 
Well, we we started out flying in in Piper Cubs, and uh, oh, they would do loops and and all that stuff, you know. And then when you'd come back of an evening, why well, you'd have to put one foot on the floor when you lay on your back, or when you closed your eyes, you'd be looping again. And uh, then after that, why well, after you finished that that cub training, why well, then. Uh, then you had a lot of bombardier training with a bomb site on the in a big tall, I think it was about 12, 14 feet tall, a triangular thing, and they had a moving target, and you was up in the air, and and uh, you tried to hit that thing. And that was duck soup. I could I could hit that thing every time, and then uh, a little later on when we was flying, why well, I, um, I would hit that that target. I just never missed. In fact, uh, they offered me, when it was all said and done, they said, you don't even, how'd you like to just stay here and be an instructor? And I told them, oh, no, 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 I didn't, I didn't train to be an instructor here. I wanted to go. Of course, that kind of shows I wasn't too smart. Yeah, well. But uh, <laughs> anyhow, I had my choice of, of staying and, and being an instructor. So anyhow, uh, that wasn't what I, what I wanted Afterwards, I kind of thought maybe it was a bad decision, but at the time it wasn't. Um, when you were training, did you uh, work with the Norden bomb site during your training exercises? Yes. Yeah, that, the Norden was a, I trained with both the Sperry and the Norden, but uh, I couldn't hit anything with that Sperry. If I hit something, it was luck. But with the Norden, of course, we were only flying at 10,000 feet, and it got to the place where... It was just so easy to put the, the those practice bombs right in the middle of that thing. I think I I forgot how many we call those things shacks when you hit the the target, and I I hit that thing so many times that they just thought that I was cheating or something. They just couldn't figure out why I was hitting it every time. But that was duck soup at ten thousand feet. Sure, sure. So. Um when did you uh, end up uh, uh, going overseas? Do you recall uh, well, roughly what year or what yeah, month? I was in, in 44. I don't remember the, the months. We, we formed our crews at, uh, at Charleston, the Army Air Force Base in Charleston, South Carolina. That's, uh, that's where we got our first B-24 and started flying in the States. Sure, sure. And then uh, did you uh, fly the B-24 over to Europe, or did you take a, uh, a ship, no, a, a we, voyage? Uh, we flew the B-24 over, and halfway over we lost an engine. And uh, it was just as far one way as it was the other, so we kept on going. If it had been a little closer, we'd have turned back and got a different plane. But So uh, anyhow, we lost a lot of altitude, and we, we did the last half of it at 5,000 feet. And then we went from uh, uh, New York to uh, the Azores. No, we went to went to Newfoundland, and then the, from Newfoundland to the Azores, and then from there to Marrakech, North Africa, and then the, then from there I think we went to Italy. Right. Um, can you tell me a little bit about? Maybe the strengths or the weaknesses or the advantages or the disadvantages of the B-24. Well, you know, the 24 was the only plane that that I'd ever i ever flew in at 17. But uh, anyhow, the we could go. They could go a little higher than we could, and uh, we could go a little farther. And of course, uh, the farther in the enemy territory you went, the rougher it got. So. We, that wasn't really an advantage to us. We, we kind of liked to stay where the fighters could, could be there to protect us. But uh, anyhow, you, they only had a certain range, and we could go farther than the, than they could. So. And you're talking about the B-17 compared to the B-24. Yeah. Correct? Right. Right. Yeah. So we could go a little farther in the in enemy in enemy territory. So, anyhow, I. I guess the well, they were more 
they were more B-24s made and flown than the 17s, but we didn't have any movie actors or, and so forth to publicize ours like the 17s did. So. Or like the 8th Air Force, right? right. That's the, right. The That's Hollywood right. Air Force. The Hollywood Air Force has sure made a difference. Yeah, they got all the honor and glory, and we figure we won the war, but then... <laughs> sure, sure. Well, you know, the 15th Air Force, of course... You know, those once those guys got over Germany in the Eighth Air Force, though, they had it rough too. They, they, yeah, they earned every penny. Yes, they did. But it was nice to want to talk to somebody that could understand you instead of talking to somebody that you couldn't understand. Sure. You know, when you went to town. Sure, sure. <clears throat> um, do you recall what your first combat mission was like? Y- yes, I had a friend that uh, went to Maxwell Field, and he. He framed my first mission and, and uh, laminated the thing, and I got it hanging on the wall. And that's, uh, that's the only thing that uh, oh, I, I don't remember a few more, but that, I do remember the first one. And uh, as soon as I put my glasses on, I'll tell you where it went. Sure. To B-O-S-O-N-D-O-R-F, oil refinery. And... Uh, I think the thing was in Austria. All right. And uh, anyhow, we went in at uh, 23,500 feet. And uh, according to the results, why, there was lots of smoke over the target and and uh, small fires. So evidently somebody must have hit it. Yeah, so. But, you know, that's one thing that the 15th, they, they, they were after the... The oil and the airplanes, that seemed to be, uh, we hit all the oil refineries and, and all the aircraft factories and the bomb and the uh, ball bearing factories. That was, seemed to be what we, what we was working at almost all the time. Well, that's very important, though, because if you can take out the oil refineries, uh, the German war machine had no fuel. Yeah, that... Uh, you know, that was, of course, it's true with the ball bearing factories. If you could take out the bearings, they couldn't make any tanks or planes or anything else, you know. And the same's true with the oil. That was that was their, their Achilles heel. You know, those, those ball bearings are tiny little sort of BB-looking things, right? But I'm the, sorry. The ball bearings are these tiny little things that look like BBs. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, if, without the bearings in the machinery... Why they couldn't make that stuff? So that that was a kind of a you know you could knock out a if you could get that bearing factory, why you could take out planes, tanks, trucks, and everything had to have bearings. That was kind of a pretty smart move on somebody's part. Sure, sure. Um, can you tell me uh, if you had any if you had any easy milk runs? Those easy I'm missions. I'm sorry, had a what? Can you tell me if you had any milk runs? Milk runs? Yeah. No. No milk runs. No, those milk runs. Uh, when we when they were briefing us, they they said there's milk runs, and when you got there, why well, it turned out to be just about as bad as any of them. No, I never had a milk run in my life. So but, you... uh, one of those milk runs was over a little old bridge in Maribor, Yugoslavia. That uh, was supposed to be duck soup. That they didn't even know the Germans thought the bridge was there. And boy, oh boy, they shot down almost all the planes. And my navigator got hit, and we had a couple of hundred holes, and the cable shot out. Yeah, that milk run turned out to be a quite a quite a mission. What were you in terms of that particular mission, or? missions and, and, and other missions, uh, what did you worry about most, German fighters or the German flak? Oh, the flak. Yeah, that, that flak was, was so thick. Well, they, they brought it in on trains. They, they'd be flak in one place tonight and then tomorrow would be somewhere else. And they'd have a whole train load full of guns that they'd move those things around. And uh, no, the flak was, the flak was terrible. The didn't have many fighters, but uh, well, that uh, Tuskegee Air Force was supposed to be our escort. And uh, kind of a funny little thing, uh, you know, one with that, the uh, 
the radio operator was calling for for fighter escort, and, and uh, we had a code that you would say tail bulb to wash mop or something like that. You know, anyhow, it it changed every day, and and uh, that way they knew who you was talking to. There wasn't a, it wasn't something that the Germans had cooked up. So he kept saying uh, tail bulb to wash mop or whatever it was, you know, and they never would answer. They never would answer. And, and then pretty soon we heard over the radio, here I is boss. <laughs> he didn't uh, use the code at all. He just said, here I is boss, and that was one of the Tuskegee Flyers. So uh, that's the only conversation we ever had with him. But anyhow, uh, they, they sure didn't pay attention to regulations they just kind of did what they wanted to but thank goodness they showed up that was it but on on the flak i don't think i ever had a mission that we didn't come back with with some holes in the plane and a lot of times they have the cable shot off or or into and or oh, the engineer would get the he got the dfc for patching the cables i took the wires off of the the uh, bomb uh, fuses those little fans and and uh, together we tied the cables together and so forth so that uh, he got the DFC out of the deal but no they, the flak was the thing we had to worry about the uh, anti-aircraft uh, as it explodes and, and sends up that that 2,000 foot box of shrapnel correct I, I'm sorry it, uh, the flak is the shrapnel that it oh, explodes, yeah, yeah, and yeah, it sends yeah. up this... Uh, yeah, that, uh, I have a, a piece of... Uh, they were 88 millimeter, and I have a piece of flak that's about an inch and a half long and about a half inch square that, uh, that hit me in the uh, left shoulder, but it didn't break his skin. It just made a black and blue green place. But uh, I have a piece of the flak suit and the flak that uh, had my name on it and I keep it in the china cabinet and show everybody once in a while and that, that uh, they were shooting at us was that your closest call your yeah yeah that was when you get knocked down with a piece of flak and, and get up from it they, they don't get much closer than that that was a oh uh, we we had a lot of uh, close calls with uh, we had a pilot to uh, that was on dope and we didn't know it and he was using the morphine in the plane and he was kind of off that day and he stalled the plane and then uh, we had to dive to pull the thing out and then we went straight up again for 5,000 feet and he stalled it out again and by that time we was below the mountain tops and had to come out in the valleys to get out of there without crashing into a mountain so we had a lot of we had a lot of close calls, but then the, probably being hit with that piece of flak was probably the closest one that, that I ever had. The, the navigator got hit. He didn't have, well, he got hit in the arm that day that uh, I got hit in the chest. And I put uh, sulfur powder, I, I took a shoestring and made a tourniquet. And then I put sulfur powder in the hole and didn't look like it'd do much good, so I got the 11 other sacks of sulfur powder out of everybody's little canvas for, uh, first aid kit, and I put about a teaspoonful of, or a teacup full of uh, sulfur powder in that place, and it stopped the bleeding. Then when we went to the flight surgeon, why that stuff had turned into concrete, I can hear that flight surgeon yet might know who put all that sulfur powder in there. I guess one package did as much good as 11. But uh, anyhow, he had to take a hammer and chisel and chisel that stuff out of there that I'd put in. But anyhow, the guy lived, so I guess it wasn't too bad. Yeah, whatever it takes, right? Yeah, whatever it takes. Um, it's, it's sometimes said, and this is a little bit of a different topic, but it's sometimes said that there's no atheists in foxholes. Um, if if you were a religious person or if you had any sort of faith at the time, to what degree did your experience in combat affect that faith? Well, I, I got a 
perfect example of that. My uh, navigator was Jewish, and the, oh, the flak was going through the plane, bing, 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 you know. And he said, uh, do you know how to pray? And I said, yeah. And he said, pray for me. So uh, I'm a, I had a perfect example of that. Well, it's said uh, no, no way. It you changed in a hurry if you weren't a Christian or had religious beliefs to start on. That's for sure. Yes, yes, that's a uh, very important stuff. Um, did, were you close with the uh, uh, with your fellow crew members? No, really, the navigator and I. But then he wound up in the hospital, and so I had to fly with other crews and so forth. But probably he was my closest friend. But uh, that uh, and the enlisted men, I I was probably more friendly with the with my enlisted men on the crew than I was with the officers. But uh, so there were on on a given B twenty four, you were an officer because you were a bombardier. Yeah. And the navigator was an officer, yeah. and of course the pilot and co-pilot. Yeah, that's the four officers. And then the rest were sergeants of some yeah, sort. They were staff sergeants from there on up. Yeah, uh, I forgot who the the CO was at, at that time, but he said they didn't want anybody shot down in a prisoner of war that wasn't at least a staff sergeant. So uh, they they made all the all of the enlisted men. Staff sergeants, just in case they got shot down, they got a little better treatment. Yeah, the Luftwaffe, the uh, Luftwaffe uh, pri- uh, prisoner of war camps, the Luftwaffe accorded sergeants and higher ranks uh, more uh, respect. Yeah. Not that the respect was that great, but <laughs> more respect than they would have other- otherwise. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, what was uh, life like when you weren't? flying in southern Italy did you what did you do for fun or what did you do for recreation or did you did you have any time for fun well if we had any time we slept I tell you that uh, all I wanted to do was sleep and it wasn't flying and uh, I'd sleep and eat and uh, I gained uh, I gained a lot of weight just because that's what I was doing I didn't exercise a Yes, I just ate and slept and flew. And uh, oh, as far as uh, entertainment, well, I played poker every night and with, a, with the rocks in a peanut can with the aviation gasoline lit, and that's what we was using for light. And next morning, we all had a headache from breathing the fumes from the stuff. So I guess my recreation was playing poker, sleeping, and eating. Playing poker, sleeping, and eating. <laughs> That's not a very recommended uh, diet, but that was it. All right. Whatever it takes, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what was uh, discipline and regulations like? What were discipline and regulations like on base when you weren't flying? Oh, uh, if we had any discipline, nobody knew it. Everybody just behaved. And, and, uh, Can you speak into the receiver a little more, please? Yeah, nobody uh, misbehaved, and as far as discipline's concerned, I never knew of anybody ever, ever being uh, in trouble. And, and uh, they just kind of let you do your own thing. And just as long as you were there when you're supposed to be, that was uh, all that was required. And uh, oh, uh, anyhow, they had a meeting one day, which everybody was supposed to. Uh, uh, ten, no, no exemptions, and uh, nobody knew what it was for. But anyhow, everybody's supposed to be there. And one of my crew members was in town, and we didn't know where he was. So the co-pilot and I stole the jeep and went to town looking for him. And we never could find him. Time we got back, the meeting was over with. So all three of us missed the meeting, but they never knew it. And uh, so every, that was the meeting where everybody joined the reserves, and. We were the only three in the whole group that didn't, and uh, they never did know that we were gone. So outside of that, uh, I never missed a meeting, but I sure missed that one. Sure, sure. Um, 
<clears throat> Could you give me uh, uh, maybe the uh, 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 a little overview of the two or three minutes as uh, uh, right before target, as you're doing your your final run right before bombs away? Could you walk me through what would that what that was like uh, as a bombardier? Yeah, well, first thing you did was to uh, make sure that uh, the pins or the wires were out of the fans, the fins on the uh, on the bomb fuses. There was a world of bombs that were dropped that still had the pins in them. And if you had the pin in it, then the, as they dropped, the, that little fan wouldn't uh, fly off, and the bombs wouldn't, wouldn't uh, go off when they dropped. They weren't armed. So that was the first thing you, you did was to remove the pins from the bombs. And uh, then after that, can you speak into the uh, receiver, please? Okay. I'm, this is a little better? Yes, yes. Yeah. Then uh, after after you disarmed the, the fuses, well, then you went back and started working your problem. And uh, you had to get the, uh, the air pressure, the wind direction, the temperature, and, and then you would take the drift by lining your bomb side up with, with something on the ground. And... Uh, Whenever you got that hair that was running parallel to whatever you had uh, sighted on, then you got your drift, and you could read on a little, little handheld computer thing that was all mechanical. Uh, I think we called a thing a C2 or something like that. And you got your drift off of that, and you put, the, you put all this in the bomb side, and uh, then you turned on all of your switches so that the, when the hairs crossed, so I... Everything would drop. You set in your, uh, if you wanted to drop them all at once or you wanted to put them at 25-foot intervals or, or 100-foot intervals or whatever whatever spacing you wanted, and you set that all in. And uh, then you had to keep correcting the, your, uh, your drift all the time. If you were, you had to have that hair running parallel. Uh, you had it lined up with, and uh, then it just came as the, the hairs crossed. You hit the salvo handle to make sure that there wasn't any any hang-ups, because uh, a lot of times those shackles which held the bomb would freeze or, or needed a little grease on them or had too much grease and it got cold and wouldn't uh, release them. So you made sure all the bombs were dropped. But uh, also in there, you made sure that that bomb bay door was open because there was a lot of bombs that were dropped through the bomb bay doors. And then the, at uh, 50 or 60 below zero, those guys almost froze time they got home. Oh, yeah. So I've they heard... said that you had to, if you ever dropped through that door, you had to pay for the doors. So you, everybody made sure that... Uh, after that, that the doors were open. Sure, sure. <clears throat> then, um, uh, in terms of um, uh, contact with home, did with you re- the, contact with uh, who? Uh, contact with your family. Oh yeah. Uh, did you receive a lot of letters, or did you write some letters? How? Well, uh, what was that like? I wrote about uh, once a week, I imagine, and I got letters about. Uh, Oh, once every two weeks or three weeks. Anyhow, you sure didn't get it every day. You got when you get one, you'd probably get five or six letters. And of course, you'd always look at the date and read the last one first. You know, and the, no, uh, the, of course, the, it took about ten days, I think, from the time I wrote to till they received it here at, at home. Of course, they didn't know whether I was dead or alive by that time, you know, but they knew I was alive 10 days ago. So, and uh, it was free. You didn't have to put a stamp on it. And uh, I had to uh, censor all of the, well, not all of them, but part of the enlisted men. You'd make sure that uh, they didn't put down where they were, what was going on. And sometimes you had to cut out a few things. But, uh, and then somebody... uh, Somebody censored my mail too. Somebody the, a little higher up than where I was. So it, 
it was a it was just a postal deal. There wasn't any phone calls or anything else. Sure, sure. In terms of the the types of things that uh, uh, w- uh, the letters from home to you would have contained, what were some of the things, if you recall, that your family talked about? Oh, they uh, they would tell us about the the uh, how the crops were doing and and the livestock and and uh, who had died and who was going to church and and uh, just just things around home that uh, and that's a, then I would tell them that I was okay and and that's about all I could could tell them so really the letters weren't very in, there wasn't a whole lot in them because there wasn't a whole lot going on here and there wasn't a a whole lot going on that I could talk about where I was. So the letters probably were pretty dull. Well, one of the things I've observed having, you know, worked with some veterans and talked with them, though, even those dull, you know, dull explanations or dull news would have still been comforting to oh, you. Sure. Because it's home and it's peacetime and it's, you know, it's 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 where you want to be eventually. It's where you want to get back to. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You you wanted to know what the, what the, what everything was going on, what your dog was doing, and you know that kind of stuff. You know, just just little stuff that uh, made a big difference. And of course, you had enough excitement where you were. You <laughs> didn't want that much excitement from home either. <laughs> oh, I didn't want any from home. <laughs> no, no excitement at all. Um. <clears throat> when did you finish your final mission? Do you recall roughly? Uh, oh, no, I don't. I, all I remember is when they uh, when they opened up the point system, if you had 120 points, you could go home. And I had 123. And uh, that was the same number I had on that, that test. Anyhow, I had three more points than I needed. And... Uh, but I had my 50 missions in anyhow, so they said, you can fly home. Well, I said, no, I'm, I'm not going to fly home. I'm going home on the boat. So I spent seven weeks in Naples waiting for a boat. And uh, so then I, I came home by boat. But when I was, when I was home, why, uh, they said, you can get discharged at uh, Fort Sheridan. But I had to stop at Fort McPherson, Georgia, for some reason. They said, you went out of the Army now? And they said, we can discharge it. And I said, okay. So me and 11 different guys from from Georgia got uh, discharged. And I was the first one home. And the first veteran home, uh, when you'd walk down the street, they, they wondered how come you wasn't in the Army. <laughs> and uh, they, But I got the... A uh, Maytag washing machine, which uh, the uh, local dealer said goes to the first veteran home, and that was me. And then about a week later, why I had a call from Decatur from uh, a uh, department store, and they said to the first veteran home, we have a Leonard refrigerator. Well, I had never heard of a Leonard refrigerator and never heard of one since. But uh, I got a washing machine and a refrigerator from being the first guy home. And uh, I kept that refrigerator for 35 years, and the thing turned from white to yellow. And it was still running, and I gave it to a guy that was working for me. And I don't know whether the thing's still running or not, but but uh, the brand of it was Leonard. And nobody else had ever heard of one. So, anyhow, it's uh, it couldn't have been any nicer to me by being the first one home. And I was home several months before the the uh, war in Europe quit, and and almost uh, a year before the one in Japan was over with. Sure, sure. During your service, did you uh, receive any uh, medals or decorations? Oh, Got a whole bunch of air medals, and uh, of course, from, from that to piece of plaque, they said, "Oh, you can have the Purple Heart," but I didn't bleed any. I just turned blue and green and yellow and different colors. And I, of course, everybody else that was getting Purple Hearts was losing arms and legs, and 
so forth. And I said, no, no, I don't want that. And so uh, I just got a whole bunch of air medals. That's about the only ones. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, once you um, uh, once you were home, do you recall where you were or what you were doing or that sort of thing when the war in Europe was over in May of 1945? Yeah, I do. I was... Uh, I was working for twenty dollars a week on a farm, uh, and uh, I was making hay. And uh, when I heard that the war in Europe was over with, and then the, the war in Japan, uh, well, as soon as they dropped the the atom bombs, I said, "Well, that'll bring the war to the close then." And sure enough, it did. And uh, well, that was several months later, and I was still working on a farm when the, when those two things happened. When the um, after the after uh, after um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, what did you do in your post-war life? Did you uh, go to college on the GI Bill or or um, uh, take advantage of some of those benefits? get out and uh, get back on the farm that I, I didn't go back to school. And, uh, Can you speak into the receiver, please? I'm, is that better now? Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. I Thank keep you. letting it down. Yep. Yeah, I, uh, I did not go back to school and didn't take advantage of all the advantages that I should have, I guess. But I, I wanted to farm so bad that uh, I just went went to work and Anyhow, I went from making a little over five thousand dollars a year to then uh, in the Air Corps to to uh, twenty dollars a week. But then at least I was doing something that I liked, and uh, that's that's what I that's what I did afterwards. And then first thing you know, things begin to go my way, and then they got a one of the neighbors who entered me an eighty acres, and another one offered to. Loaned me money to buy a place, and people that I didn't even know offered to help me. And first thing you know, I was on my feet and going again. And then I wound up then owning about 500 acres. And but I started off at working by the month. So anyhow, it was quite a. I just wanted to get home so bad. Well, that uh, was undoubtedly a, uh, uh, a desire that many of your uh, uh, fellow servicemen uh, shared. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We just wanted to get home. Well, I just have one more question for you, um, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to say anything or make any comments that, you know, you may have some memories that may have been uh, jogged by what I was saying or something else. If you have anything you would like to Add before I ask that last question, please feel free. This is your, this is your platform. Okay. Well, kind of an odd thing that happened to us. Uh, one time in the nose, before we took off, we noticed there were four flak helmets up there, and it was just me and the navigator and the nose gunner. So there'd be three of us. So we knew we had one extra helmet. And um, sometime or other during the mission, the navigator got sick. So he puked in one of the helmets. And a little later on, the nose gunner got sick, and he didn't tell anybody either, and he puked in the other one. <laughs> so when we went over the targets, why, I had my eye in the bomb sight, and I couldn't put my helmet on till uh, the bombs were dropped, and then you put your helmet on. Well, anyhow, they each one had a nice empty helmet on, so when my bombs dropped, I went to put my helmet on, and that and had puke in it. I lifted up the other one, and it did too. And by that time it froze, I just put it on anyhow. Then after we got on the ground, I read the riot act to both of them. I, I said, after this, you, if you get sick, you tell somebody. But it was our 23rd mission, and they didn't want to admit that they got sick after that. It's all right on the first two or three missions to get sick, but not on the 23rd. So that, uh, if I had got hit in the head, then they never would have got that sorted out, I'm sure. 
But anyhow, that's one of the honorary things, the nasty things, I guess, that happened to me. Yeah, no, that's that's a great story. Yeah. Well, I have one. Well, uh, oh. I have a, I have another story that's kind of funny. Sure. The uh, Tom Brown, who's dead now, but he was from uh, Georgia, and he talked with a with a terrible accent. I mean, he had to think he could cut it with a knife, and uh, he was also the uh, uh, bombardier, and and in, being a bombardier, he was in charge of all the gunners. You were the gunnery officer, and uh, he had the his waste gunners were were shooting, and the the empty casings or the shells were flying all over the uh, the waste. And he he told this guy, this gunner, he said, if you'd put your chest chute on, and then the shells would the empty casings would hit that, and they'd fall in a pile and it'd be easy to clean up, and. Uh, so a little later on, he went back there, and the guy was just shooting up a storm, and and the, the shells was flying all over the the waste, and he picked up the guy's chest chute, and he said, here, put this on and save your brass. Well, being from Georgia, the guy didn't understand what he said, so he put the chute on and jumped out the window. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, isn't that funny? You know, that that's oh uh, then uh, if you got you got a little time? Oh sure, please. These okay. are great stories. These these add uh, humanity and color to the war. Anyhow, I, I had a friend uh, Bob Langford that lived at Albion, Illinois, and he got shot down and and uh, I had no idea what happened to him. Anyhow, uh, one of the missions I was on, I was supposed to be hitting the bridge in, between Buda and Pest. And uh, uh, I missed the darn thing, and and the shells, uh, the bombs went off down the street about a mile from the bridge. And I heard him speaking at a, at a meeting, and he, I heard him say that uh, it wasn't the Germans that almost killed him. It was the the uh, slap happy bombardiers so after the meeting i couldn't wait to talk to him i beat it up there and i said what what's the rest of that story he said well they the germans put us in in buildings close to targets so that uh, we wouldn't bomb that target you know for fear of hitting the people that was in those buildings the hospitalized ones and said i was in a hospital bed on the second floor in a warehouse, in a with the wheels on the bed, and said some slap happy bombardier missed what he was shooting at, and blew the side out of that building, which let the floor down, and said it dumped me in in this hospital bed on wheels out in the middle of the street, and said that that was a, I come near getting killed doing that, and and so I said what was the date of that thing? And it so happened that I was the bombardier on the on the mission that that dropped my good friend that had been shot down and had a broken leg, and dropped him out of the hospital bed in the street. Wow, that's that, a that's a that's an odd one, isn't it? That's a, a small world and a coincidence. That's isn't what that, that is. The truth? Small world and a coincidence. Well. Um, any other stories or any other oh, reflections? I could go on, but then you probably don't want to. No, oh, well, no, please, please. I, I had my agenda of all my questions, and you yeah. answered them. So if there's anything else, this is. Well, you know, uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, I had a good friend that got shot down on his first mission. And uh, the Germans captured him, and they decided to move him 400 miles to a different camp. So they told them, said, now these police dogs are going to run along the side, and if you get out of there, they're going to attack you. So the first day of walking, they was all walking down the middle of the road. Dogs were running along the side to make sure that they didn't uh, escape and so forth. The second day, the dog's feet got sore. So the dogs started limping. So they, they had the prisoners carry the dogs. 
and the dogs, they became real good friends of the prisoners. They'd lick their ears and so forth. So they took turns of carrying these police dogs. And they went through one town that had a woman pushing a baby in a baby buggy. So they set the the baby in the mother's arms and took the baby buggy and they put the dog in it. And then they had the prisoners pushing the baby buggy. And there wasn't any bearings on those things. And after about 10 miles, the wheels fell off. So they would... They'd still leave the dog and the baby bug in, and four of them then would carry the the uh, baby buggy with the dog in it. And the uh, next time they'd go to a town, well, they'd find another baby buggy, and they'd get one with wheels, and the prisoners would push them. So anyhow, after the war, why this guy's grandson said, Grandpa, what did you do during the war? And uh, since he'd got shot down on his first mission, he said, the only thing I ever did was push a dog and a baby buggy halfway across Germany. <laughs> and he was telling the truth. Well, that's, uh, that's a great story. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Well, I have one last question for you. Okay. And this, is, um, this is a question I ask all uh, World War II veterans, whether they were in the Army, Air Force, or the Marines, or the, or the Army, or the Navy. Um, do you consider yourself to be a quote-unquote hero for what you did or what you saw? Oh, well, compared to my fellow veterans that went through the same thing I did, I'm, I'm no hero. We, we all did the same thing, and we all did it willingly. And, and of course, in the Air Corps, everything was, uh, you as a volunteer, you could refuse to to go on any mission if you wanted to, but that you'd never fly again if you did. So I no, I I, I guess I had to be a hero because uh, I came back, and, which was something that lots of them didn't. But uh, as far as being a hero, I'm I'm sure there's a lot more that did lots more than I did, and and uh, it, it it depends on who you're who you're associating yourself with, you know. No, I'm, I'm just lucky to be back and glad, to, glad that I am. Well, that, that answer you gave is, is one that's uh, quite you know, similar to a lot of the other uh, veterans from your generation. What I find is you're a very humble generation and uh, definitely uh, willing to do your duty and so on. And one of the reasons why I asked the question about the quote-unquote hero is that in 2008, the term hero is thrown around so much that it, you know, it's, you've got sports heroes and you've got this hero, you've got that hero. But I've, I've always been impressed with your generation's humility and willingness to serve your country and make those sacrifices. So thank you. Thank you for for listening to me rattle. No problem, no problem. I am going to stop the tape at this point, and uh, then I will chat with you briefly afterwards. All right? All right.